සුපින් අධිවේග පරදා ඔබ මවිත කරවන වේගයක් බිඳ ගන්න. පීවර තුලකින් ශ්‍රී ලංකා ටෙලිකොම් ෆයිබර් ඔප්ටික් ජාලයට එක්වන්න. slp.lk වෙත පිවිසෙන්න. Making headlines on first at night. Strengthening ties. President Maithripala Sirisena arrives in Georgia to attend the 5th Open Government Global Summit. In the House, Minister of Development Strategies and International Trade Malik Savra Vikrama clarifies allegations over the FTA with Singapore. Why should be, you be scared of competing with the world? China Link. Minister of Megapolis and Western Development Partly Champika Ranavika says that China has won the confidence of Sri Lankan government. China, on the other hand, has gained our trust by supporting our development. Back home, the seven fishermen who went missing recently and found in Maldives arrives in the island. Bad optics. US President Donald Trump's comments after the meeting with Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin that angered many in the US, including those in his own party. Other than a first at nine. Sponsored by Nestle Mall Plus. Now with the goodness of oats from Nestle. A very good evening to you and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Katharina Chang. Now on to your top story tonight. President Maithripala Sirisena arrived in Georgia to attend the fifth session of the Open Government Partnership this morning. The President arrived in the Shota Rastaveli International Airport in, in Plitsi, the Georgian capital, where he was welcomed by the Deputy Foreign Minister of Georgia, George Sharashidze. The President will attend the fifth Open Government Global Summit, which is to be held from today until the 19th. The OGP 2018 Global Summit will focus on civic engagement, fighting against corruption and public service delivery. President Sirisena will take part in the summit's key high-level panel discussion tomorrow. The head of state will also hold a bilateral meeting with the Georgian President Georgi Magvalshvili tomorrow. The Speaker of Parliament, Karu Surya, today signed the National Audit Act, which was already passed in the Parliament. In the meantime, the free trade agreement with Singapore was taken up for debate in Parliament today. Responding to allegations levelled by the opposition, Minister of Development Strategies and International Trade, Malik Samra Vikrama, moved to give clarity to the negotiation process of the agreement. He said that stakeholders were continuously kept in the loop on the status of the talks and that around 20 consultations on the topics were held with a wide range of stakeholders over a period of 18 months. On 21st December 2017, a cabinet paper was submitted by me containing the draft agreement. And the cabinet meeting of the 16th January, cabinet approved the agreement, submitted and granted the approval for me to sign it during the visit of the Singapore Prime Minister on the 23rd of January. Another argument is that we did this without consultations. I can responsibly state to our members of this House that we frequently kept stakeholders informed of the status of the negotiation and possible commitments that would be take to be undertaken. Over the 18 months, about 20 consultation sessions were held with a wide range of stakeholders, including business chambers, trade associations, and professional bodies. Another assertion is that we, never, we can never amend this agreement. That is also not true. Article 17.10 of the agreement provides for amendments to be made to the agreement. Can you table the list of stakeholders that attended your meetings? I'll submit it to Parliament soon. The next session, Article 17.12 of the agreement provides for termination of the agreement by either party giving notice and it will be effective one year from the date of notification. There has been much debate on the liberalization of services. Let me be very clear, we are not opening up to any country the independent movement of persons. To be eligible in the first place, that worker should have been employed in the relevant Singaporean company for at least one year and should have five years industry or professional experience. Above all this, our country's immigration laws will always apply and there is no exemption from that. Another argument is that non-nationals of Singapore can take undue advantage of this FTA. This is again a baseless claim. This agreement defines, uh, Singaporean, defines a national as a citizen of Singapore 
or a permanent resident of Singapore. A lot of disagreements and a lot of doubts and a lot of dubious issues with regard to this agreement. Yes. It appears to be so, so as a result of not having a comprehensive discussion about it. Long I have days. always indicted for a dialogue, but they have not attended. Your leaders have been telling you from time and time again. You ask. Furthermore, it is mentioned that Pakistan and Thailand rice can be imported through Singapore. This is not allowed under the rules of origin criteria. Another frequently cited issue is about manpower agencies. There is no reference even for senior management personnel for such recruitment companies under this services subsector. A Singaporean recruitment company can set up an office in Sri Lanka as is already allowed in the current legal structure, but it cannot recruit personnel from abroad since mode 4 is unbound and no commitment taken to open. Unlike in other FTAs, signed by Singapore with other countries where the level of liberalization is more than 90% of tariff lines. In the FTA with Sri Lanka, we limited it to 80%. So 20% of tariff lines or 1,887 items were kept protected because of a concern on domestic industries and revenue. Items like footwear, confectionery and many other sensitive items have been kept out of the agreement. 97.88% revenue from custom duty is protected. The Socialist Alliance calls on the government to reconsider the free trade agreement with Singapore. Addressing a media briefing held yesterday, leader of the Lanka Samsamaja Party, Professor Thissavitharan, has said that it's prudent that the government only import the human resources that is lacking in the country and avert allowing a free flow of human resources through a free trade agreement. The government, instead of working out the type of policies that we have been advocating, where we develop our own human resources according to a plan and decide on what human resources we have and fully utilize them while getting from abroad only whatever resources we are lacking. Now, that has not been done. In the absence of that, the entire professional community workforce of this country is going to suffer as a result of these ad hoc measures which are being taken by this government through this free trade uh, agreement. As the, the Socialist Alliance, we condemn these mo moves and urge the government to have proper consultations for our development process. Meanwhile, the Government Medical Officers Association, too, heralded warning calls over the Singapore Free Trade Agreement, announcing that they will move for an island-wide trade union action on Thursday. Secretary of the GMOA, Dr. Harita Ludge, stresses that such agreements should only be penned with a proper national trade policy in place. If you go for a trade agreement without a national trade policy, you will lose your interest and the other country will gain the benefits. Therefore, we have stressed upon that agreements like Singapore Free Trade Agreement, ETCA, which is proposed to be signed with the India, should be initiated only after having a proper national trade policy. But the thing is that the government and the other authorities, they are not listening to our demands so that we have no options. But we will be declaring a trade union action on 19th of Thursday after the General Committee meeting. And we have requested his section as the president to take the initiative in appointing an authority to prepare a true national trade policy. The Sri Lanka Poduchana Perumuna has been a critic of the opposition leader Asam Bandhan for a while, calling into question the execution of his duties and responsibilities. In a recent remark, the party's chairman, Professor G.L. Piris, highlighted Sambandan and opposition leader only for the main's sake. Professor Piris did not uh, relent in his criticism as yesterday he announced that 70 out of 92 members from the opposition are prepared to address a letter to Speaker of Parliament expressing their lack of confidence in our Sambandan as the opposition leader. He added that MP Dinesh Gunawardana has been proposed to take over the role. Today there are 92 members in all sitting in opposition in the Sri Lankan parliament and of the 92 members, 70 members belong to the joint opposition. Now each of these members will sign a letter to the speaker uh, indicating that they have no confidence in the current leader of the opposition, the Honorable R. Sambandan, 
and they believe that uh, Mr. Sambandhan is for all intents and purposes a member of the government. He's only nominally in the opposition. On no occasion has he been able to raise his voice against the government on any significant issue other than matters relating to the northern province. And when the no-confidence motion was brought against the Prime Minister, the Honourable R. Sambandhan played a major role in defending and protecting the Prime Minister. The Honourable Mahindra Rajapaksa, the, His Excellency, the former President, has entrusted to the Honourable Dinesh Kunavardhana the leadership of the opposition in Parliament. So the pith and substance of the letter is to call upon the Honourable Speaker without any further delay to recognize the Honorable Dinesh Kunwardhana as the leader of the opposition. We believe that a refusal to do so is not merely completely wrong in terms of principle, but is also contrary to the constitution. Students' Union of the Rajarata University organized a protest in front of the University Grants Commission today. The demonstrations led to one lane of the route from UGC to Town Hall being closed for several hours, causing severe traffic congestion in the area. The Students' Union of the Rajarata University held a protest in front of the University Grants Commission today, demanding proper educational facilities at the university. Protesters also accused the university administration of not taking measures to provide purified drinking water to students. Although the protest did not turn violent, the anti-riot police were seen at the ready with police officers in riot gear along with water cannons. Riot police also closed one lane of the route from UGC to Town Hall. Requests by the students to hold discussions with officials of the UGC were also not fruitful. Protesters, however, dispersed later, claiming that it is not their intention to resort to violent strike actions. Meanwhile, employees of 11 companies, which manufacture safety matches, launched a protest at the clock tower in Kandy today. Protesters accused the government of failing to import gunpowder and other necessary chemicals required for manufacturing safety matches for almost three months. They also went on to accuse authorities of conspiring to decimate the safety match industry in the country, paving way for imports. Later in the day, however, protesters temporarily suspended their demonstration following discussions with the Senior Deputy Inspector General of Police of the Central Province, DRL Ranavira. The senior DIG informed protesters of the Defence Secretary's promise to import 20 metric tons of gunpowder and other chemicals in the coming weeks. The joint opposition is seeking an apology from Minister of Finance Mangala Samravira over misquoting figures pertaining to fuel prices under the previous government, alleging that the Finance Minister's remark, where he highlighted the price of a barrel of oil eggs existed at 40 US dollars per barrel, to be inaccurate. Parliamentarian Bandra Gunawardhana urged Minister Samravira to issue an apology to former President Mahinda Rajapaksha. The finance minister is claiming that former president Mahindra Rajapaksha sold one litre of petrol for 122 rupees when a barrel of crude oil was just 40 US dollars in the global market. It is an utter lie because a barrel of crude oil was never at 40 US dollars during the tenure of the previous government from 2005 to 2014. And then he goes on to invite the former president for an open debate on fuel prices. For the survival of Minister Mangala Samaravira, one must launch an investigation into the individual who is supplying him with these figures. The country is disgraced both locally and internationally because of these lies. It's not worthy of his position as the Minister of Finance and Mass Media, as well as someone who is hoping to be the leader of the United National Party to make such statements. He apologized to the Rotary Club and the Lions Club of Sri Lanka for making allegations against them. Therefore, we believe that the finance minister must apologize to the former president for this mistake. Notices have been issued on the fuel prices and they too are fake. It is just 8.5 million rupees worth of mudslinging. The Ministry of Home Affairs and the Information and Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka are currently engaged in a project geared to give the public easy access to services provided by divisional and district secretariats. 
under the project websites of 331 divisional secretariat and 25 district secretariats will be upgraded in line with the latest technology. Accordingly, websites of 19 divisional secretariats and the district secretariat of Gaul were upgraded by the 30th of last month. The upgrading process of 13 divisional secretariat websites and that of the Colombo district secretariat is already underway and is due to be completed by the 30th of this month. The engineering faculty of the University of Peradeni is closed until further notice. The vice chancellor of the university, Professor Upul B. Disanayaka, said that protests by students against the administration's decision to bar a faction of students who did not meet the required 80% attendance rate from sitting for the examination prompted the faculty closure. Let's now take a look at some other stories making news across Sri Lanka. Today is the fifth day of the procession at the Ruhunu Maha Katragama Devalaya. The procession took to the streets yesterday with the casket being paraded by the Devala Tusker Vasana. TV Derana and FM Derana provide the media sponsorship for the Asala festival. Tomorrow is a significant day of the procession as the tusks of Kandula, the tusker ridden by King Dutugamunu into battle, are put on display. Wildlife officials in Kataragama launched an operation to capture crocodiles habiting bathing spots along the river Manik. It intends to make the river safer for devotees frequenting the river during the festive season. Accordingly, a captured crocodile was relocated to Block 2 of the Yala National Park. The seven fishermen who went missing along with their trawler before being found in the Maldives recently were brought back to Sri Lanka today. Our correspondent said that they were brought to the island on board flight UL-102 at around 5 past 11 this morning. Chairman of the Ambilipitiya Pradeshya Sabha, M.K. Amil, was sentenced to three months in prison by the Ambilipitiya Magistrates Court for assaulting a policeman in 2013 in the area of Panamure of Ambilipitiya. Other than a reporter said that he was also ordered to pay 30,000 rupees in compensation to the relevant policeman. Charges brought against M.K. Amil also include obstruction of duties of a police officer. You are watching. Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Welcome back to the news. Minister of Mega Police and Western Development, partly Champika Ranavaka, believes that China has gained the government's trust as the superpower supports Sri Lanka's development initiatives. The minister expressed these views at an event where a Sri Lankan company signed a memorandum of understanding with a Chinese company on providing responsive prevention and protection services in partnership with business entities. Our vision for the Western province is to develop it has economic, trade and commerce, naval and aviation, knowledge and education hub that optimally leverages the enablers of knowledge-based innovation-driven economy. With this overall plan being implemented, a network of strategically important cities will be developed simultaneously in parallel to the Western megapolis complementing its development program. This plan is dramatically different from the plans of previous governments where development was largely piecemeal, scattered and based less on development science, more on political expedition. While many nations are ready to offer assistance to us, we have seen in the past that much assistance was based on many conditions and tied into instruments detrimental to the future of Sri Lanka and have the opposite effect to the one intended with respect of, to citizen well-being and containment. China, on the other hand, has gained our trust by supporting our development as we want to develop our country. This has India both the government and the private entities of China, to us since we are clearly cognizant of the fact that the China's macro development plans and Sri Lanka's local counterpart plans are congruent and will eventually lead to even stronger socio-economic cooperation between our two nations. In order to facilitate these efforts, the Ministry of Megapolis has a specific mandate to engage with Chinese private sector to explore possibilities of obtaining both goods and services from China to achieve our own development goals in the categories I have already mentioned. 
As Sri Lanka opens its doors for further investments in mega projects through the One Belt, One Road initiative, matters pertaining to international commercial dispute resolution comes into the equation. President's Council Chandaka Jayasundra spoke on the role of international commercial courts with special emphasis on the Singapore International Commercial Court. There was no specialized law or there was no specialized judicial system that was introduced to regulate or adjudicate on dispute resolution mechanisms in international financial centers. This changed in the, I think around 2009 or so, when this concept of an international commercial court started again in England by, if I'm not mistaken, a former Lord Chief Justice in England, who thought that people or persons who are working in commercial high courts or commercial courts internationally should work together so that there is uniformity in the application of the law in different countries. But the most successful that has been recognized as the most successful is what is called the Singapore International Commercial Court. Now, the Singapore International Commercial Court is part of the Supreme Court of Singapore. All judges of the <coughs> Supreme Court and the High Court of <coughs> Singapore can sit in the International, uh, sorry, Singapore International Commercial Court. Then, other judges also, or other lawyers or jurists in other countries also, in certain instances, become judges of the SICC. This becomes an adjunct of the Supreme Court of Singapore. Majority of the judges are persons from Singapore, but you do bring people of jurists and judges and lawyers of high repute as judges in that court. So in Singapore, therefore, a dispute between two companies in Singapore, as long as it is commercial in nature and it is international in nature, will be decided by this for all purposes of private court of law. British Prime Minister Theresa May won a series of votes in Parliament yesterday, keeping her overarching strategy to leave the European Union just about on track, after bowing to pressure from Brexit supporters in her party. Brexit supporters targeted the government's so-called customs bill, hoping to toughen up her plans. The UK government narrowly avoided a defeat on its customs bill after agreeing to Brexiteers' demands to change its wording. It twice survived by just three votes after a backlash from pro-EU Tories who accused Prime Minister Theresa May of caving in to the party's Eurosceptic MPs. Defence Minister Guto Beb resigned so he could vote against the government. Pro-Brexit lawmakers voted 305 to 302 to approve an amendment that will stop Britain collecting tariffs for the European Union after Brexit unless there is a reciprocal arrangement. But instead of facing them down and fueling tensions, the government accepted their four amendments. May spokesman said the changes to the bill, formerly called the Taxation Cross-Border Trade Bill, did little more than put government policy into law. Parliament finally voted 318 to 285 to pass the bill. It will now go to the Upper House of Parliament before becoming law. The Osha price index ended 0.8% firmer at 6,179.88, its highest close since the 29th of June. The market turnover stood at 459.9 million rupees, around half of this year's daily average of 892.3 million rupees. We now have Imesh Fernando from the Kalama Stock Exchange for a detailed report. The market capitalization at the end of the day was 2,886.76 billion rupees. Today's foreign purchases were 179.81 million rupees and foreign sales were 172.58 million rupees. There were five crossings today and the crossing turnover was 157.58 million rupees. Premier News Channel, other than 24-7.
U.S. President Donald Trump is facing a barrage of criticism and is running the risk of being an isolated figure within his own party after he defended Russia over claims of interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential elections. At a summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Finland, Trump contradicted U.S. intelligence agencies, saying that he had no reason to meddle. There had been much speculation ahead of the summit between U.S. President Donald Trump and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin, with some factions calling for the summit to be called off after 12 Russians were charged for meddling in the last U.S. presidential election. Protests followed Trump during his two-day visit to the U.K. and things weren't different in Helsinki either, with the only difference being they were also protesting Putin. Trump's comments after the meeting, however, has angered many in the U.S., including those in his own party. Trump has been denying any collusion with Russia over the 2016 presidential election and staying true to form, he said just that when he addressed media in the presence of Putin. I hold uh, both countries responsible. I think that the United States has been foolish. I think we've all been foolish. We should have had this dialogue a long time ago, a long time, frankly, before I got to office. And I think we're all uh, to blame, but uh, I do feel that uh, we have both made some mistakes. I think that the, the probe is a disaster for our country. I think it's kept us apart. It's kept us separated. There was no collusion at all. Uh, everybody knows it. President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. And what he did is an incredible offer. He offered to have the people working on the case come and work with their investigators with respect to the 12 people. The top Republican in Congress, House Speaker Paul Ryan, said Trump must see that Russia is not our ally. The president's own intelligence chief, director of national intelligence Dan Coates, publicly broke with him as he released a statement saying Russia is responsible for ongoing pervasive attempts to undermine U.S. democracy. In a strongly worded statement, Ryan said, quote, there is no moral equivalence between the United States and Russia, which remains hostile to most basic values and ideals of the U.S., unquote. Putin, however, denied the claim. Following the media briefing, Trump gave an interview to a U.S. media outlet and repeated his denial of Russian involvement in U.S. elections. In the process came the words which angered many. I think it's a shame. We're talking about nuclear proliferation. We're talking about Syria and humanitarian aid. We're talking about all of these different things, and we get questions on the witch hunt. But I thought that President Putin was very, very strong. Sri Lanka Cricket announced yesterday that the country's 2020 league, the Lankan Premier League, will be postponed. The tournament was set to get underway on the 18th of August and the dates will be scheduled, uh, decided by the board. Speaking exclusively to First at Nine, director of the Lankan Premier League, Russell Arnold, said that things beyond the control of anyone caused the postponement. Extremely unfortunate, but as we all know, with the uh, Sri Lanka Cricket Board elections being postponed and not happening and there not being an elected body, uh, it's a tough situation to make calls. It's a time that we had to make um, very important decisions, big decisions, uh, and therefore, with uh, just about another month and a half to go, uh, we felt that it will be quite risky in trying to go forward because um, with the forming of the LPL, we also had lots of challenges to overcome with the international calendar, the availability of international players and in the marketing aspects. But we were on track and we were very confident that we could put out a good product on which we could build on uh, for next year. We all know that uh, Sri Lanka do need uh, something of this manner to stay in touch with the world and also for our younger players to improve uh, their skills under pressure situations. We feel Sri Lanka is being left behind. But unfortunately, things beyond anyone's control have occurred and uh, therefore it's been postponed. So hopefully, once matters are sorted out, we can start moving forward and uh, try and get the LPL up once again. Manush Jayatilika is at the other Weather Center with your forecast first evening edition. A very good evening, everyone, and welcome to Forecast First. 
Those who are in the northern, eastern and northwestern parts of the country will have to brace for scorching temperatures of up to 36 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, lowest temperature is forecast in the central hills at a mild with 20 degrees. Moving on to rain forecast now, light rain can be expected in the western, southern and central provinces. But most districts will see favorable weather conditions tomorrow. That's it from your weather center tonight. Up next is your city by city forecast. That's it for Maladarna first at 9 for tonight. But before we go, we'd like to leave you with some visuals of Aberdeen Forwards located on Kehel Gamu Oya near Ginigathena in the Nuvarere district. The 322 feet tall fall is named after the city Aberdeen in Scotland and it is ranked 18th among the tallest waterfalls in Sri Lanka. We hope you enjoy these visuals and have a pleasant evening. The news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Other Varana 24 7.